The Chris Holtman era at Ohio State is over. Welcome to Snap Judgments, brought to you by Byers Auto. That is Bill Landis and Doug Maurice. I am Austin Ward, and Ohio State's not waiting for the end of the year. They're not waiting for the buyout to drop in the summer. They're not even waiting for the new athletic to, director to arrive and get moving. The plug has been pulled. Bill, Doug, you guys have spent a lot more time covering the Chris Holtman era uh, and being in this the arena than I have. So all I can say is, the extension two years ago, I'm on the record, was the dumbest one humanly possible for Gene Smith. So let's start with that. That's where my take on this begins and ends. And Bill, uh, what does this mean for Ohio State basketball as a whole? I mean, I mean, it, it had to happen, I, I think, right? That the program could not keep toiling in uh, mediocrity is probably even generous, right? They're, they're totally Very irrelevant. Both, yeah, generous. they're totally irrelevant in, in the Big Ten and, and certainly nationally, and that's not where they want to be and, and certainly not where you want to be this long in the Chris Holtman's tenure. And um, I, I'm still surprised that it happened now. I certainly thought we were trending towards this decision at the end of the season, and there were some considerations, I suppose, about waiting for the buyout to drop because it would have dropped a couple of million dollars, I, I believe, had they waited until um, after April or so to, to do this. Uh, but they're doing it now. It's going to cost them, well, at least right now on paper, it's going to cost them $14 million, to your point, Austin, about that extension. We'll see if anything gets negotiated um, in that regard to, to perhaps lower that number. Um, but it needed to happen for Ohio State basketball. Like for the sake of Ohio State basketball, it had to happen. So um, I'm, kind of, I'm glad for Ohio State basketball fans that they have a little bit of closure on this, but certainly wasn't expecting it um, on February 14th. The, the main thing that buyouts when they're a problem is when they prevent action. So it, it didn't prevent action here. I don't like if he mm. didn't, if he never, uh, if he never got the extension, Austin, and you're right, it's a terrible extension, but the worst part of that extension would be, well, I guess we got to give him two more years. So now it's just their money. So they set their money on fire. So I guess maybe the diet Cokes, the concession stand will cost a quarter more next year or whatever like there is an impact but mm -hmm. the biggest impact would be allowing this basketball program to wither even further because you were beholden to a terrible extension so as bad as the original extension was i think you have to say like well at least they didn't live and die by that i just i, I that's what i find so irresponsible about the way that this was handled if somebody else wanted to hire away Chris Holtman two years ago, Ohio State should have been fine saying, okay, please do that. I, I don't – it goes back to this conversation that we have all the time, and there's no right way or wrong way to determine it. For me, Ohio State basketball standard, forget about the fact that they are currently nationally irre irrelevant, and that shouldn't happen for any Ohio State sport. There had already been documented evidence. The only way you could justify – oh, Chris Holton hadn't met whatever the standard for Ohio State basketball should be is, well, he had injuries, or he was too young, or he's got great recruiting classes coming in. I thought that there was a case two years ago that even if they didn't want to fire him after that, that they just simply didn't have to give him an extension at all and then let the next year play out, which he then proceeded to miss the NCAA tournament. And you just can't keep making excuses for that. And yes, there's broadcast money that will cover this. Like That's what it's for. They're going to spend it. But the, the wasteful use of resources across college football is absurd. And for Ohio State specifically, it usually is much more measured about the way it does business. And they're just, I don't, I honestly don't feel, you guys can argue with me if you want, that, that any kind of extension was merited whatsoever at this time two years ago. No, I, no, I, I certainly don't think it was. Like, and there were, I think at the time, was that when the LSU job was open and Chris Holtman, I think, like was a candidate for that? His name his name gets floated for a lot of jobs. How much of it is real? Probably not not very much of it, but it's the nature of the business. So like I, I kind of get why that would influence things. But I also I'm I'm assuming that Gene Smith felt some kind of impetus to like stick with the guy that like that he picked, right? Like he he made a pretty radical decision to get rid of Thad Mon at the time that he did it. And I think he probably wanted to prove himself right, and the only way to do that is to attach himself even more to Chris Holt. Well, I'm not saying I agree with that, but I'm assuming that's what the rationale was at the time. Um, but the result is you put Ohio State basketball in a pretty serious hole. Now, I, I will say that the nature of college basketball is such that I think it is easier to climb out of holes in college basketball than it is in college football. So I, I don't, I don't think that it has set 
the program on some uncorrectable course where it's going to take a couple of years now for it to get back to where everybody wants to do. I think it could be like almost an instant turnaround as long as they hire the right person, but you don't want to put yourself in that position in the first place. And, and they definitely did that by extending Chris Holbert at the time that they did. Yeah. I think they got played by the agent probably. Right. Yeah. Agent yeah. earned the money there, but, but that's the point Austin. It's like, there's not a single Ohio state basketball fan that had Holtman left then would have been like, no, what are you doing? Don't leave. Nobody would have said that. It would have been right. like, okay. So, uh, yeah. Bad call. But the worst call, right, is is letting one bad decision lead to another. Which is why are we not stunned? Bottom, like, did we not think that they were then going to have their hands tied, A, by the extension and the buyout, B, by this crossover with the athletic director role, and instead they were like, the heck with it. We're not being... We're not beholden to anything. Get this guy out of here. I do think that's the most fascinating part of this decision, Doug, is is when it was made. It, it's it's inevitable. So it can be one of those situations where if you know what the outcome is going to be, just rip the Band-Aid off and, and be done with it. But, okay, so Gene Smith is currently in charge, and he's taken some responsibility, I guess, for that extension and, and said, it's got to be done, and it's going to be done under my watch. I'm going to start cleaning up this mess. But you could have certainly made a case to just wait uh as bill alluded to like if some if you save a couple million dollars it, is the hiring process underway ross bjork is not in columbus right now you would have to assume that in some form or fashion you want your new athletic director to be bought in with your second you know number 2 power ranking revenue sport you are still trying to get 10,000 15,000 plus back into that building at some point you would want to have some alignment there over recruitment strategies and philosophies for the program and excitement and buy-in with both of those so that Ross Bjork feels some attachment to the basketball program moving forward. But I don't know logistically how all of that works. I That's why I thought that this may not happen on Valentine's Day with uh, uh, you know two and a half weeks left in the Big Ten season for Ohio State to play out the string. But evidently losing on the road and looking as sloppy as they did offensively at Wisconsin on Tuesday night was the final straw, although it was probably the uh, devastating home loss to Indiana that that signaled to Gene Smith it was over, though I don't think he even stayed to watch the end of that game. <laughs> so, you, sorry, go ahead, Doug. The, like, the thing that has happened, Ohio State is the worst basketball program in the Big Ten. I, I don't even know if that's in dispute right now, and I have some numbers from the last couple of years, but I think that reality – sort of trumps everything else. It's like, well, it, like, cause it's not, it's not even that like, you're not good enough. You're the worst. I'm not sure Ohio state has the worst team in the big 10 in anything. I don't know the status of all 36 sports, but <laughs> this is the largest wealthiest athletic department in America. And then the second most important sport, they're worst. They're the worst. That I, so I think that trumped everything, Bill. Right? Like, like, like why, yeah. why did this happen? Because that. They stink. Yeah, I mean, right? They think there's total, there's total apathy. I think with with the program at the at the moment, the arena, which is hard to fill anyway, is is half empty when they play their home games. I, I also wonder, like, it, the timing of this is interesting to me because their next game is at home against Purdue on Sunday, and I also like any part of this is like avoiding like a what they call a dead cat bounce where like they beat Purdue and it's like maybe they do a little something like you know that you have to make a change you don't want Chris Holtman to be the, the head coach any longer but you also don't want to provide him the opportunity to have some kind of rallying moment like they had last year in the Big Ten tournament to to convince people that maybe they should give him one more year so like that that the timing of this <laughs> is interesting to me in, in that way too he should have to stand on the sideline on Sunday for that beatdown if that is the risk like that he maybe beats Purdue who cares? Everyone knows that they're not going to make the tournament. The decision yeah. has been made. You're going to force, I assume, Jake Diebler to go out there, uh, a proud alum who's been part of the glory days for Ohio State, quote unquote, some of them, and go get massacred on national TV by Purdue. That's that's Chris Holtman's responsibility. Even after he's been fired, he should have to be out there on Sunday. Just sit in the sit in the suite and watch it happen. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um <laughs> Maybe that's too far. Maybe that's too much for me. But I don't, where did this go wrong, Doug? I mean, I, well, I think the three of us were all we were all there when he was first hired, and it was like that first year with Kata. It's like you can see him actually accomplishing something here, but it it never got that good again. So 
it went wrong the opposite way that I thought it was going to go wrong. And, and I will say, you know, I've been doing this for probably the two, um, probably the two coaches in my career that I've been the hardest on, uh, that I thought they were wrong for the job were Hugh Jackson with the Cleveland Browns and Chris Holtman with the Ohio State basketball. Mm, and, that's and not I'm just, company you want to keep if you're Chris Holtman. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just here to say I was right both times. So everybody can cram it. So, but like <laughs> Holtman, I've had like multiple conversations where I've written critically of Chris Holtman and he's called me on the phone. And so, like, we've had those discussions. But the thing that I thought might happen was I thought if he, butlered his way through his Ohio State tenure, it wasn't going to work. And that idea of only recruit to the Butler level, right? And try to make it with like three and four year college guys. When you're in Ohio State, you should be going after top 100 recruits. And it's the opposite of that. He recruited well and then couldn't coach him. So Mm -hmm. I am surprised by this. It's not that he couldn't recruit at Ohio State's level. It's that he couldn't coach at Ohio State's level. And I've been very intrigued. I did a series last year before I came over here, like talking to other Ohio State coaches. I talked to Nadine Muzzerall with the women's hockey team, Kevin McGuff, Tom Ryan, Ty Tucker, people who are winning at Ohio State. And all of it, the unsaid thing was, talk about the standard at Ohio State so we can compare how Chris Holtman is not living up to it. And Kevin McGuff said it then, and he said it again when we talked to him last week. Kevin McGuff said he learned a lesson in that when he got here with the women's basketball team, he thought they had pretty good teams, but he was just recruiting good players. He wasn't building teams. And he feels like he made a philosophical shift to, it's not just about recruiting rankings. You've got to build cohesive teams. And we see what the women's team is now. The women's team is a beacon of light at Ohio State. They're awesome. And they have good players, but they fit together. That feels to me, Bill, like that's direct contrast. Yeah. All right. You got Felix Okpara. You got Bruce Thornton. You got Roddy Gale. But how does it fit? Does it make sense? And he couldn't tie it together or coach it together. And so the recruiting rankings kind of kept him alive a little bit because it was like, well, these young guys, it's a good class. It's a good class. No results. And that surprises me because I thought maybe the guy could coach but not recruit. Turns out he could recruit but not coach. Yeah, I, I feel the same way because I, I had similar concerns about his ability to recruit at the level that Ohio State um, requires, and I think clearly he he did that. And Jake Diebler, who lost to mention, I think is, has been a big part of that as well. But it, it just never clicked with the the coaching piece of it. And even I thought, like at the end of Thad Mata's tenure, and I know you've said this before too, Doug, like you would watch who he was bringing in and think to yourself, like I don't see how this fits together. I, I don't. I never really thought that with the classes that yeah. Chris Holtman has recruited. Like I think it makes like the, the pieces se- seem like they should make sense to work together, and and they're just not. Um, and I, I I don't know what that is. I, I suppose there's something to like some coaches being better suited to like kind of coach up guys rather than you know coach elite players to to their to their maximum. And maybe that's something that that we're dealing with here. I'm not entirely sure. I don't think Ohio State has an elite roster, but I think it has a pretty good roster. That's why the, the results this year have been so surprising. Um, but that disconnect is, is, is odd. And I, I, college basketball is a little funky in that way too, right? It's not, it's not a direct parallel. I think the college football where like, if you have the best rosters, you, you win most often. I actually think that's, or, or the best recruiting results you win the most often. That seems to not exactly be the case um, in college basketball. Regardless, there was, there was something missing between, elevating the recruiting to the point where like he was starting to get Ohio state back to the point where it was having first round NBA draft picks again, but the results on the floor are just like not matching it whatsoever. And it's a very odd dichotomy. It's weird because he, Chris Holtman would seemingly dating back to the the start of his tenure, check a lot of those boxes. He's been very active with the fan base and the community and, and the students and they doing that every single year and treating them to canes. And he has the recruiting success in the profession, he's very he seems to be very highly respected both by other coaches. We've all seen the the Jay Wright text. Um, Doug, I think we probably got called about the same time two years ago uh, to have that shared directly with us. Um, you have all that. You have national media members who seem to have really good relationships with him and believe in him as a coach. And like all those things should should point to success. But that's I think what makes it puzzling. You just said this, Bill. It's like something else wasn't connecting and. It's hard from outside Value City Arena to put your finger on what exactly that is, but it's been clear for quite some time. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe it would have been different if he got to play out a COVID tournament. I don't know, but I doubt it because it doesn't. Nothing else has translated since then. 
I, I wonder about like the, you know the the assistant coach hires he's made maybe have have um, not led them in the right direction. They've had a serious downturn defensively um, from where they were at the beginning of his tenure, and that was like kind of his calling card when he came here. It's like he's like a, the he's a defensive minded coach, I, I think. Um, and but but certainly his first couple of teams like that's kind of how they got by. They just played really good defense, um, and they've been terrible the last couple of years. They're like a, they're like a little better this year, but still not very good. And now the offense has taken a downturn with it, so. Um, he's had some staff turnover, some guys that have left for head coaching jobs, um, a guy that left for like a parallel job at Purdue, um, and maybe he's just not backfilled those the way he, he's supposed to. I, I don't know, but it, it is it is weird that the way that it kind of like slipped away from him and just sort of gotten progressively worse really, really since the end of that season where they didn't get like they didn't get the opportunity to play in the tournament with a team that like looked like it was pretty good. Who knows what that would have been like? I'm not necessarily i'm not really willing to give chris holtman the benefit of the doubt and so like oh yeah that team would have won the elite eight as if he's like done that with any other team in his career because he hasn't he loses in the first weekend and that's what he does more often than not so um but that was a good team and then after that he was just never really able to figure it out he should never have come here and i think people knew that when it happened that he inherited a situation at butler what Brad Stevens built there goes to the Celtics. Brandon Miller takes over is there for a year and then has stuff happen. And Holtman gets that job and is making tournaments at Butler and Ohio state is too prestigious and the money is too good. And I don't know if he ever actually wanted to take it, but it was like the job you couldn't say no to. Mm -hmm. And I think that played out to some degree. And I'm not saying that that's his fault because he got a lot of money, but I don't know. Like, has he been happy? That has anybody been happy? The fans aren't happy. He they killed. They killed. They took a beautiful basketball program and they they killed it. Like, sweet little program. I crushed it. I don't know when. How long has he been happy here? Right. I, it it never seemed. And again, like it's a nice guy. Listen, I I honestly just it, it's fine if you're a nice guy. It. it Honestly, doesn't matter. Just win games. Like, like, like that's the last defense. If he's a nice guy, he's. A, he seems like a wonderful person. But it, I just think that the fit was never quite right. And I do think, like Thad Mata, when Thad Mata stepped up, Thad Mata was like, "I'm gonna scream and yell and spit my gum and like I want this." And I understand what it is to be number two to football, but like bring this. As it turned out, I make a girl Greg Godin, bring it, and I. If he would have stayed at Butler, he'd be freaking he'd be there right now. Like Butler's gone through like a whole kind of thing. Lavelle Jordan didn't work out. Now they're on to Thad Mata, and they're having a good year this year. And I I am I would almost guarantee there's a part of Chris Holtman today, especially, that is like, why did I ever leave? What have I done? <laughs> and then he'll go count his millions and and yeah, you know, that's... ride around the, the neighborhood throwing money in the air and say, Oh yeah, that's why. But it never was right. It never was. Yeah. I think about like Chris Ash making that move to Rutgers where it's like, I have to, you know, I'm not going to like it. I'm not going to win. Not saying that Chris Holtman thought that he was going to come to Ohio state and not be able to win because he did early on. It's fortunate to inherit Kata Bates Diop and Jay Sean Tate, but that's, that's not his fault either. But there were several things along the way that I think maybe go to your point, Doug, about him never being truly comfortable with it. And I think about that year one and like, he brings out the manila folder and he's like, here's what everybody said about me and this Ohio yeah. state team finishing ninth in the big 10. Guess what? You, we, you're going to come coach at Ohio state. Yes. Ryan day. The criticism comes with the territory day talked about that. Even last week in his, you know, everybody's celebrating the off season he's having. It's like, I just, I'm going to be criticized. I lose three straight times to Michigan. That's part of the territory. Chris Holtman never seemed comfortable with that. And largely he wasn't treated like all that harshly by the Columbus media because I, we're not holding him to the same standard as football. And I don't really think that anybody ever has done that. But even when things were going pretty well, I think it was like the third or fourth off season, like they brought in some transfers. They had us in for like a, a summer press conference bill. And he like kept pointing to this spot on the back of his head. He's like, my wife's worried about me. I'm, I'm losing all this hair and one pot patch in the back of my head. Like the stress and the criticism did never, never seem to, sit well with him and it only yeah. got worse since then no that's right which is always always very funny to me when like people were like is chris Holtman gonna leave ohio state for kentucky is like 
See no. the toll that this job has taken on this man? You think he's going to go to the biggest fishbowl in college basketball just because he's from Lexington? No, uh, I think I think you're right. Like like fit fit matters, and I'm I'm not going to be hypocritical and say like at, at at the time I don't think I was hypercritical of of the decision to bring him in, and like certainly after the first two years, it felt to me like okay, this is this is going in the right direction. Um, Doug asked the last time there was like happiness. It was probably when they beat Iowa State in the tournament in his second year with like the Iowa State team that had like three NBA dudes on it. And they were in Tulsa and it was a road game basically. And no one thought they were going to win. And they beat that team by playing um, some really good defense. But that that's probably the last time that there's been much in the way of joy <laughs> for Ohio State basketball. And that was a long time ago. Um, too long, too long ago. And, and Ohio State fans should be feeling joy more often with this basketball program than they have certainly the last four years all right so where where does ohio state turn doug i i know that you feel no candidate should be off the table here Mm -hmm. i I don't have a list of them i don't know that anybody has a great idea for what direction the search will actually go or who's leading it but i know that that's how you feel it should work out yeah, we talked about that on a show last week. I mean, I think anybody short of Bill Self, like, it should be a candidate. So we talked about, like, Tony Bennett at Virginia, who's won a national title, but is from Wisconsin, and Scott Drew at Baylor, but who is from Indiana. You know, like, go find some Midwest guys who are out there. So it to me, it doesn't have to be – you don't have to get the Butler coach. Go get a power – go get a guy who's made – It'd be weird more- if they did that. I, well, I, I know, I mean, like two in a row, kind of, I know Thad was at Xavier, but that's Butler Roots. Like, that's like, oh, you mean bring Thad back? Yeah. I, don't think, I love Thad. I, I, I like Thad too much. I will say that Thad got fired going 18 and 18 in his last two years combined in the Big Ten. Right now, Ohio State in the last two years in the Big Ten is 9 and 25. That's twice as bad. So I don't think anybody should be off the table. I think they swing big. I don't think you fire somebody this early and then don't swing big. Right. So like that, but, but again, it it felt like last time people were like, let get Billy Donovan to leave the bulls. It's like, okay, like short of that somewhere between (laughs) an NBA team and Butler, that big swath of candidates in there, there find somebody in there because I, I will, and I will make this point. I, I think this is factually correct. Ohio State is a tier two college basketball program. There are the Blue Bloods. There's Duke and North Carolina and Kentucky and Kansas. And I guess maybe remnants still for UCLA and Indiana, even though they're having bad years here. But like we get that. Ohio State's not that. They are absolutely in the next tier. Historically, resources, recruiting base, present day, expectations, everything. They are absolutely tier two. I did. I, I can't find it. I did the research moons ago, five or six years ago, probably, of trying to figure out. I think Ohio State probably is like the 13th best program in college basketball when you take all those, those things into consideration. It's not in the 30s. And people point to the fact they haven't won a national title since 1960. That's not what it's about. It's can you win in the modern day, given the circumstances and the situations? And they a thousand percent can there's a lot of programs there's not many i mean that that win super consistently so you have to have that in your mind you have to take into account that they are nine and 25 in the big 10 they are in the last two years big 10 record nine and 25 they are currently the worst basketball program in the big 10 and they should be something like the fourth best program in the big 10 and the 15th best program in college basketball and higher with that in mind what do you think, Austin? Do you think they should be able to take a swing at anybody? Yeah, and I, especially more than ever, you you referenced the point early on, Bill, that it's easier to dig out of a hole in basketball than football. And some of that is just basic math. The, the roster is smaller. The number of players that are impacting the game is smaller. Uh, you're going to have an outsized impact if you land on a, a superstar player, or you should if you can coach them to the next level. But Ohio State has other things that are working in its favor here, aside from just like being Ohio State and the block O. Like financially, the same things that are helping the football program are going to help men's basketball. The collectives can be involved; they're going to be engaged. It is a uh, a market in Columbus in Central Ohio that has a lot to offer to these players. You look back, like some of the guys that have been through here, even in the Holtman era, like. Bryce Sensabaugh was here two years ago. It's not like they aren't they are incapable of landing 
high impact NBA players to come in here. So you you've already proven that you can still recruit because it's Ohio State. Secondarily, if you're going to use now different than any other period in college sports history, the transfer portal combined with name, image, and likeness, Ohio State has more to offer a coach and a roster than just about all these other programs. I would say, Doug, like, is, is it ever going to be as important to Ohio State fans as football? No. And is it ever going to be as important, important as it is to Duke basketball fans and North Carolina basketball fans and Kansas basketball fans? No. But those other programs that are like 6th through 13th, like Ohio State's going to have more momentum at its back to elevate and that doesn't mean that I'm saying they're gonna the next coach will win a national championship, but I bet he's gonna go to some sweet 16s. And if he doesn't, you can move on quickly and go on to the next one as long as you don't stupidly extend them when you don't have any evidence that they can reach the level that you want. So uh, again, that makes it I'm not trying to pile on Chris Holtman when I say that. I think the the loser of the situation was Gene Smith with the extension because it was clear that they could move on and find somebody else to get them to the level that Chris Holtman had shown he could not get them to. I'm not blaming him for that. He took the money. He took a job that was probably outside of his capability. I don't have any bad thing to say about him as a person. But Ohio State's not maximizing the opportunities, and a lot of people have heard me say that throughout all the other shows with this offseason, heading into it in December for football. Whether that's Gene Smith now or Ross Bjork in whenever, two weeks, three months, it, it shouldn't be that difficult for Ohio State basketball to recognize what kind of potential it has. I agree. You guys want to throw out a name just for fun? Not be not be beholden to it, but just like a name that's in your head that you would like to see Ohio State go after? I... I wonder, like, is this too much of a cop-out? Like, just because he's available? Like, is Jay Wright actually interested? I think that he. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's that's not an up and coming name. He walked away from you know the game happy. He's found a niche in broadcasting. Maybe his skills don't translate directly to Ohio State. I I don't. I really don't know. But if we're talking about big swings, that's somebody that if you make a move in February and you want to start, like, couldn't you get him in the job Sunday? Not yeah, no, it's good. like, yeah. couldn't you? If that's the point, like, couldn't you do that right now? Um, I think you could. He's 62 years old, um, but I don't know that that should matter. That's still fairly young. Um, I don't think there's a world where Jay Wright replaces his good good friend Chris Holman, but <laughs> his good buddy. It's worth a phone call. It's worth a phone call. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I think that's like maybe it's too easy just because he's on the sidelines, and and, and maybe that's not creative enough thinking for Ohio State. And if those are criticisms of that name being floated out there, I'll certainly be wrong about that. But he fits the – if you're making a list of things that you're trying to accomplish, I would think that he checks a lot of boxes for that. And and maybe that makes him a fit. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Yeah. Doug, you have somebody? I, I'm just going to keep saying Scott Drew because, like – so Scott Drew, right, is the son of Homer Drew, who was a longtime coach at Valparaiso University, the brother of Bryce Drew who made this – I used to work at Valparaiso, so I know the Drews – more than most people should. Jake Diebler, who we're talking, <laughs> is probably going to be the interim coach, played at Valparaiso. So the Dieblers and the Drews know each other. Now, Scott Drew was gone and already at Baylor by the time Jake Diebler played there. But Jake Diebler would have the ability to tell Scott Drew, like, man, there's a lot of potential here, brother. Like, I'm telling you, like, you can win here. And Scott Drew took that Baylor job. He was the head coach of Valparaiso for one year. He took the Baylor job when it was at its bottom when it was the worst job in college basketball because of all the terrible things that happened off the court there. And he built it up to this. He's been there for 20 years. He's won a national title. Like what else is there? Throw a pile of money on him to come back to the Midwest. Yeah. What about he Bryce did. Drew? Bryce Drew has like done it and failed. Like I think they're better than Bryce Drew. Like yeah. Bryce Drew got fired at Vandy. And now he's at the school that is an online school that has a basketball team. How do they have a basketball team? They're an online school. <laughs> they don't even have a gym. I don't even know how they have a team. Yeah, but Jim, they have a great home court environment at Grand Canyon University. But yes, yeah, it is. So, it's like it's like if the Vry had a basketball team. So that's the thing. It's like no offense to you, Bill, but no, the coach <laughs> at Grand Canyon should not be at the top of Ohio State's list. The Who's national saying, champion right from there. Baylor, yes, the national yeah. champion Baylor. Bryce can come be an assistant. That's fair. I like I like both those names. I would throw out. Uh, I know, like I think people will look at Sean Miller. 
maybe I can see that. I, I think you can maybe swing a little bigger there and get someone who's still more on the up um, rather than someone who's looking for like a redemption story. Um, I like Tommy Lloyd at Arizona. Um, and I think he only makes like three million dollars a year, which is kind of crazy. And um, the Arizona Athletic Department has no money. Is a, is a mess. Yeah. So um, he's done a really good job at Arizona. He's from Washington. Like his roots are out west, and maybe that should matter. But he just looks like he's a really good basketball coach who's gotten the job done at Arizona. Um, so I would make a phone call to him as well and see if he would be interested in perhaps doubling his salary to come coach at Ohio State. Well, that would also be up to the Ohio State administration to want to double that salary too, right? I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that allowed Ohio State to lose leverage was Chris Holtman believing that he was underpaid and could get raises elsewhere, which is why his name kept coming up for other jobs in two or three years ago, right? I mean, you looked at, you stacked up one through 14 in the Big Ten that way, and Chris Holtman himself felt like, Ohio State basketball was not funded at the level that put it on even footing with Michigan State at the top or Wisconsin. And, you know, maybe there's some point to that, that not all of this is uh, an indictment of who the actual coach is, but a decision for Ohio State writ large to decide what it wants from its basketball program, which I don't, I honestly, it doesn't matter what I want. It doesn't matter, Bill, what you think it should accomplish or Doug, what you think it should be like. When we have this debate, it's Ohio State that has to decide that, right? Like they have to decide, do they want it to compete for national championships or is the Sweet 16 fine? In which case that determines what kind of candidate you're going to go after and how much you're going to pay them. We think they don't want to compete. At, like what, What? again, I've referenced this only a million times. The conversation Gene Smith had the day he fired Thad that I wrote about and that like his standard was this should be a top five program in the country and we should be, in the mix all the time. And they have not come close to that. They, again, to repeat, are currently the worst basketball program in the Big Ten. What, do we think they have not shown that they want to – like with that – with the the words, the words on the day they hired the guy they just fired, they said it. Have they not shown it since then? Or do we think – I mean, looking up at empty seats, those are, that's all money they're not making when they're not selling soft pretzels and Diet Cokes and they're not selling tickets – do we think they have been short in their commitment to men's hoops? I, I think a little bit. Yeah. I, I, I think maybe I saw someone in the comments say like the extension had to be done before recruiting purposes. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. It's to be based on results on the floor and they weren't good enough at the time that the extension happened. Um, and I think like doing that and like accepting what had led into that extension, I think shows to me that they weren't serious enough about what the basketball program should be. And you can also give an extension, by the way, without fully guaranteeing the contract that puts yeah, you on too. the hook for nearly $14 yeah. million. Like it was, eh. I'm going to use Matt Brown's simulator and be like, this is AD 4,000 malpractice. Like a fully guaranteed contract for someone who had never been to a Sweet 16 doesn't insure you anything for recruiting. And guess what? If that class falls apart, you can sign other players and you can go into the transfer portal. Like that should never be an excuse for retaining coaches, especially in college basketball. So, but so our the main belief of the way they have not shown that they want to co compete at the highest level is extending the guy that they just got fired. Like it really, what you're both saying is it's it's basically the commitment to Holtman is the proof. Is there anything else that you would cite, or is everything else? It feels like no. I think in terms of like Sweet Sixteen. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. Right. Like, okay. I mean, they should uh, bulldoze the arena and build a new one, but that doesn't necessarily show a lack of commitment to the basketball program necessarily. I think it shows more of a commitment to having a spot for the circus and uh, One Direction. <laughs> and yeah. Monday Night Raw. Now, come on. It, now first, of all, Raw. first of all, One Direction played at Nationwide and then One Direction played in the shoe. So don't even bring it in here That's talking true. about One Direction <laughs> playing in the shot. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> to me... To me, to, I, I get it, maybe it's an oversimplification, but it, it was the contract extension for me that said, okay, they're condoning this level of success. Mm -hmm. That's good enough. And that's what I couldn't believe because that doesn't sound like the way Ohio State evaluates literally any other program. You said it. Like, do we know of anything else in the 36 that is bad? Like, I don't. I think most, like, you're looking at women's hockey competing at the very top. You're, they made a change with the lacrosse program when that wasn't good enough for for where the standard that it wanted to be at. What women's basketball is doing right now, uh, across the board, it's like 
you obviously can't be the worst program in your sport. That doesn't have to mean that you win the championship in every single one that they compete in, but that is the standard, which is the standard at Ohio State. Like they, you compete with the very best every single year, except for apparently men's basketball, where they're like, you know what? That's okay. Haven't won the Big Ten, haven't made a run into the second weekend of the tournament, not selling out the shot. Don't worry about it. No one ever does that at Ohio State basketball. You're cool. Let's just keep it rolling. And here you go. Here's $22 million. All right. Just we love you, buddy. Let's go. <laughs> and maybe this is the line in the sand. Yeah. Because I, mm -hmm. I think could, could you view the contract as an AD with the blind spot for a guy he hired who believed wrongly in his heart that the best was yet to come? No, this isn't good enough, but this is the guy to make it better. I knew it when I plucked him out of Butler. This is the right, like it's, it could be that. And now that it's like, nope. Now it's like, let's go. Let's go. Yeah. And if, if that's the case, good. So be it. The fans deserve that. Like this, this, and I think it's hard to be a diehard, like multiple sports, right? The Ohio State fans are with football through thick and thin. They're with basketball through thick and they bail when it's thin. That's fine. But they have proof of that now. They're losing money when their team stinks. And so, and they also have proof that when it's rolling there, that place, even though it's not a great arena, gets rocking. So they have modern day examples of how good it can be and how bad it can be. And I think being this aggressive with the firing would maybe be some indication of like, all right, no more messing around. Let's get after it. We want to be one of the 12 best programs in college basketball. Yeah, I think you're right. All right. Well, we'll find out, depending on how Ohio State and whoever makes the call and whenever it happens, what they view for the ceiling for this program was as Gene Smith makes the move to move to fire Chris Holtman, Ross Bjork is on the way uh, ostensibly to help hire the replacement, and we'll see what happens with the basketball pro program moving forward. They make the move. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, you're fired. Chris Holtman. That's the end of that. That's the end of Snap Judgments. They're brought to you by Byers Auto. Thanks to Doug Maurice and Bill Landis for jumping on with me on short notice for some live Snappy Jays. We'll talk to you later.